Day after day, we are surrounded by the presence of criminals. We are spectators to the deepest darkness in human actions and the bizarre reality that someone's suffering can be a form of pleasure. As dedicated investigators of the criminal world, we're on a mission to uncover the most shocking crimes and get inside the minds of those who commit them. I am Luke, and today I bring you another unreal true crime. The Case of the Shelter of Terror Rosa del Carmen Verdusco was born in 1934 in Zamora, Mexico, into a wealthy and well-positioned family within the community. She and her four siblings received a good education due to their status. Money was not a concern for the Verduscos, but something about this privileged reality troubled Rosa's mind. While she and her family could afford anything they wanted and enjoy a good life, thanks to her father's ability to run commercial businesses, other children faced harsher realities. This seemed unacceptable to her, and from the moment she became aware of it, a compelling need to make a change about the issue that bothered her was born. Even at a young age, she understood that it was up to her to make a difference. However, this task would not be easy, as she came from a strict family, and she knew it well. It was rumored among the inhabitants of Zamora that in her preteens, Rosa had fallen in love with a laborer, and her parents did everything possible to stop the progression of that relationship. At that time, Rosa had no choice but to accept her parents' order to distance herself from that man. Outraged by what she had to endure, she swore she would never marry, but she would have children. One day, while walking through the streets of her city, she met a boy slightly younger than her, who was 13 at the time, living in the open. Rosa felt she could not turn a blind eye and had to remedy the terrible situation the boy was going through, rescuing him from poverty. She took him to live in her house with her family so he could finally rest under a roof and have a meal on the table. Her parents refused, considering her too young to face such a responsibility, but they eventually agreed to receive him due to her persistence. For time, this activity became a habit for Rosa, or rather, her passion. After a few months, the number of children living under her care had multiplied. Amidst this turmoil in the Verdusco household, her father passed away. Although this terrible event deeply affected Rosa, she saw it as an opportunity to fully pursue her dream. So then, she convinced her mother to buy her a house where she could shelter and help more children. On one hand, Rosa was just as young as her rescued children and also needed adult care, but on the other hand, she would no longer have to occupy her own space. This was how Rosa settled in her first home, but she experienced firsthand what it was like to live without money or food. Far from being an impediment, she went out to walk the streets of the city with the other children to earn their daily food. Her dream was coming true as more and more children arrived at the home under her wing. The shelter began to receive donations from residents and prominent personalities, who were moved by Rosa's altruism, allowing her to gather the necessary funds to buy a larger plot of land and build a shelter with much more capacity, the same shelter that years later became known as La Gran Familia. Rosa Verdusco's work was quickly recognized by the population, who were inspired by her commitment and devotion to the care of minors, and consequently, donations soon appeared. Food, school supplies, cleaning products, and money, among other things, made it possible to maintain the place that Rosa and her children built with their own hands. In 1947, La Gran Familia opened its doors, but it was in 1973 that the establishment became a civil association, 
not only receiving street children but also those whose parents could not maintain them due to various difficulties, or who were affected by substance abuse. Keeping them under a roof was one of the objectives, but the priority of the shelter was to provide them with the necessary education to allow them to be professional and independent individuals in the future. For this reason, they had an educational program including primary, secondary, high school, and even university extension careers, recognized and validated by the government. In addition to conventional training, the miners attended physical education classes, sewing workshops, and many more categories. However, one of the most outstanding and proudest for Rosa was musical learning. The children residing in the establishment had to learn to play an instrument or sing. Thanks to this, a large orchestra was formed that did not miss a celebration without presenting their musical number. La Gran Familia gained great popularity reaching the ears of many politicians who decided to support and get involved in the project. Governors like Vicente Fox and Felipe Calderon, to name a few, became great admirers and allies of Rosa Verduzco. The work carried out there was so recognized that even during a visit by Queen Elizabeth of England to Mexico, she requested to meet Rosa Verduzco in addition to donating a bus for transporting the children and money to build a gymnasium. Rosa agreed to the meeting, but added a condition to the Queen's request. She was willing to receive her if the children could be present at the venue and share a meal with her and the prince consort, as well as offer them a musical number. Rosa Verduzco made it happen. It was known that with her undeniable determination she could achieve everything she wanted, and she had already proven it over decades. Thanks to that defining character, over the years, hundreds of children were welcomed into that home. All were received. However, as often happens in such cases, not everyone was very happy with her way of being. Rosa Verduzco faced controversies from the beginning of her project. One of the first reasons she was criticized concerned the location of the shelter, as it was located in an affluent area of the city. Her neighbors were not willing to share space with an establishment that, at first glance, looked deplorable, as it had been built by inexperienced hands, and occasionally some walls would crumble and had to be rebuilt. However, there were more terrifying reasons to judge what happened at La Gran Familia. Amid so much kindness and generosity seemed to hide a secret, a secret that only those behind those doors seemed to know, or at least someone that no one dared to tell, for fear of Rosa's reprisals. It was very common among the neighbors of the city to see her in the streets with a group of children. Some were sent to beg for money or sell newspapers to collect money. Meanwhile, others, the more privileged or at least chosen by her, accompanied her to have a chocolate she invited them to. But it was on these occasions that Rosa's authoritarian character became visible to those outside the shelter. In popular celebrations, when the town gathered in the streets, Rosa sent the children to ask for toys and authorized them to bite people who refused to give them anything. On the other hand, merchants or anyone who crossed her path were obligated to make some type of donation that Rosa demanded. The woman had the freedom to do and undo. It was evident that she had a power that exceeded her good intentions of running a home for children. Soon, the inhabitants of the city realized who this popular personality really was. She was greatly admired to the extent that parents threatened their misbehaving children with sending them to Rosa's place, as if that was the worst punishment they could receive. Everyone was aware and divided between those who praised her and those who hated her. However, what seemed unnoticed by the authorities was the actual happenings at the shelter as no one dared to even visit the place occasionally to ensure it was operating according to governmental regulations. 
For 60 years, Rosa operated with perpetual impunity, aided by a corrupt system that delegated to one person the work others were incapable of doing. But the truth hidden beneath the her kindness and generosity was unmasked in July 2014, after receiving more than 50 complaints from people external to the shelter and survivors of that hell. The Attorney General's Office of the Republic intervened at La Gran Familia to begin an intense search. Families of people who had been through the place and those who had experienced the mistreatments recounted to authorities about extreme conditions of insalubrity, carnal abuses, physical punishments, and deprivation of freedom. During the search at La Gran Familia, the police confirmed the huge amount of spoiled food that was provided to the children which consequently led to severe cases of malnutrition. Among the testimonies, a survivor recounted being forced to eat flies just to get something in his stomach. Furthermore, other horrifying confessions reported that an endless number of crimes occurred there, threatening the integrity of the children, with numerous cases of abuses perpetrated by the same teachers or caregivers of the shelter. Some stated that within the establishment, there were many pregnant women who, after being forced to give birth, had their children taken away and registered under the Verdusco surname, thereby depriving the mothers of any rights over their babies. Thousands of children were adopted by Rosa Verdusco, despite its illegality, and worse yet, nobody stopped her from committing the crime. On the contrary, it was allowed. What Rosa did next with those children is even more heinous. Having legal custody of the adopted people allowed her to keep them away from their families until they reached adulthood. Whenever their relatives tried to visit them, they were violently expelled from the institution. But later, when they were supposedly able to finally go out into the world as restored individuals, Rosa demanded an exorbitant sum of money in return as she had authority over them, effectively finding under that excuse a way to traffic people. It was impossible for these families to gather the demanded sum, so some never managed to leave. Moreover, if they tried to escape, they faced brutal beatings and confinement in cells to the point that one of the victims reported that after a failed escape attempt, their ears were cut off as punishment. What had once been a shelter had ultimately become a prison. Long list of testimonies exposed the tortures and crimes committed within La Gran Familia. At the time, the Attorney General's office witnessed firsthand the deplorable state of the facilities children sleeping in broken bunk beds among trash, rats and bedbugs, completely dirty bathrooms, and terrible infrastructure. The nauseating odor emanating from the place could be felt from the street, with excrement, urine, and decomposing food revealing the reality that was lived there. It was evident that the place was neglected, and the money from donations was not being used for improvements. These findings cast doubt on the benevolence that had positioned Rosa Verdusco as a legend, a saintly figure in Mexico and the world for decades. Thus, finally, on July 15, 2014, the 81-year-old woman and six of her assistants were arrested. Meanwhile, more than 600 people living there, including minors and adults, were rescued from the precarious conditions. Despite all the evidence against her, Rosa Verdusco was released without any charges due to her delicate health condition. The burden of pre-existing illnesses, such as diabetes and heart problems, led to physical and cerebral deterioration, requiring her to be hospitalized. While outside the building, a crowd gathered to pray for her speedy recovery. Others protested against the justice system's decision for not acting in accordance with the reported evidence. Finally, two years later, at the age of 84, after being hospitalized again for 20 days, Rosa del Carmen Verdusco passed away due to a sudden stroke. As for the other accused, 
Out of the six, only two were charged with the crimes committed. The others were released just like Rosa. In 2016, two years after the discovery of the truth, the Attorney General's office declared itself incompetent to follow up on the investigation into the case, deciding to leave it in the hands of the state. To everyone's surprise, the case remained unresolved, without any resolution, and much less any detainees paying the sentence they deserved for the committed crimes, including deprivation of liberty, the abuse suffered by the children, and the trafficking of them, among other horrific acts. The nickname, The Boss, was not given to Rosa randomly. It was her political contacts who called her that, due to her decisive character, her authoritarian personality, and her ability to run a business of such magnitude. What never became clear was how a person with such a strong vocation for service from an early age turned into such a sinister figure, forgetting the true reason why she was there. Some theories suggest that she was involved with Mexican cartels and that La Gran Familia was an ideal place for money laundering. Others believe her ties with politicians personally benefited her, and in exchange for those favors, she forced people to vote for her allies. Indeed, there were those who claimed she was an ambitious woman, extremely strict, who enjoyed others suffering and having control. The reality is that today, the population is divided between those who choose to believe in her good intentions, considering her a saint in life, and those who assert she was one of the most evil people in Mexican history. This contradiction has sparked discussions, even among renowned personalities in culture and politics. What cannot be forgotten is that once again the judicial system has been incapable of providing a certain response to a population that for years hoped the truth would be revealed, and that when it finally happened, nothing changed. And that's the end of today's case. As always, I appreciate your support for my work. If you subscribe, like, and share this video, it will help me continue creating content. This was another episode of Unreal True Crime. See you soon.